Uh, welcome to Argumento Podcast. Uh, after a long time, the three of us have joined back for us for a session. And joining with us is Alden Desuza. So, hi, Alden. Welcome to Argumento Podcast. Hey, thank you, Joel, for having me. Uh, thank you, guys. Yeah. So, uh, Alden is actually uh, he's a, he's a uh, law student from Christ University. He's also the co-host at the Imagine Order Podcast. Also, one of the uh, inspirations for for me coming up with the idea of the podcast as well because he came up with, uh, with a with a podcast called Tixit do check it out it's, it's still available on Instagram as well so yeah uh, uh, yeah uh, alden uh, especially with regard to the topic at hand and we have come to discuss upon uh, the the bench in the supreme court had actually observed that the national disaster management authority and that authority comes under the, the disaster, Man- disaster management act and it stated that it actually failed to perform its duty and uh, also it has given a timeline of around 6 weeks to frame a few guidelines as well especially for those who have lost their loved ones uh, uh, who, especially during during the pandemic as such so uh, what really comes off this particular motive as to how the government whether it's capable of trying to compensate for those victims and how does the law stand true with regard to the same right <clears throat> so currently so there were two red petitions that came before the supreme court uh, by two people so the court decided to club the two and uh, have hearings on the same for compensation for covid victims uh, people who uh, so families who have lost uh, a loved one to covid they would uh, so these two petitions basically asked the government to provide some sort of compensation to them so uh, so the same thing is provided under uh, the disaster management act Uh, which was brought in in 2005 with the with uh, the sole purpose of creating uh, uh, policies and plans to deal with natural disasters and one of the things is also not just uh, prevention it is also to deal with the aftermaths of any disaster right so um, section 12 of the particular act deals with compensation and it uh, lays down a certain obligation on the government to compensate people who who are victims uh, to a disaster and uh, that was essentially pointed out by these writ petitions that were brought forward and uh, the court in their uh, judgment basically agreed with the same and they and uh, they stated that it, there is a statutory obligation of the government and that it's not a uh, it's not something optional that the government can wipe or so uh, can you know provide to its people so this was something that was uh, uh, that was dealt with in this case and comp- and now they've given a timeline so sure what they've said is not that you can't give you have so you have to give compensation but the court did not deem it uh, uh, appropriate to provide a certain amount a certain uh, reason for uh, uh, a certain amount to be given for compensation and this was not because of any affordability issues or anything because uh, something that was interesting though the media has been reporting it as uh, or the government uh, says it can't afford to pay this in fact the uh, uh, in fact mr kushar mehta very clearly stated that look the government can pay for it because even if you take all the covid uh, covid debts in the country close to 4 lakhs even if you give them each 4 lakh rupees right that amount is a frac- is a very small part of our gdp right so we well, we can afford it but it's not the question of affordability it's more the question of is it does it make sense to give compensation is it rational uh, in an economic sense to pay uh, that much of compensation so yeah it was basically a very for, interesting word like basically for the social security schemes as such basically instead of paying it on one go for Correct. the compensating them uh, pay right. it for the infrastructure uh, the health health infrastructure or, or basically for other protection scheme as such so that that uh, that's what the the claim or, or the argument was posed by the exactly by the exactly side. so they cited all the budgets for the uh, you budgets uh, allocated for the health uh, health ministry and for all of these uh, for the vaccination drives and for the insurance schemes given for front line workers so they cited the same thing look we're investing in health infrastructure and we're trying to prevent deaths in the first place so i think it, for us it makes more sense to pay here instead of give a lump sum to any person who has been affected by covid 19 so that's what the entire is and moreover technically uh, when we uh, specify spe- specifically speak about section 12 per se uh, one of the arguments made before the court uh, against the petitioner's argument was uh, uh, section 12 definitely like you just said is not something that is mandatory 
was a statement that was made. So the quote was pretty specific, pretty, uh, what do I say, pretty much clear and to avoid ambiguity was uh, specific with the fact that if you look into the section 12, it uh, goes like this. National authority shall recommend, it shall recommend guidelines. So the court uh, went about to specifically speak, it's a shall clause. You cannot uh, come about and say it's just a recommendatory clause that the government may choose to provide. And uh, moreover, with respect to the affordability aspect of it and the plausibility of providing any amount of money. So the court did not, so we cannot uh, at all uh, state the fact that the court went beyond its scope of designating compensation to the victims because the court clearly said uh, the court right here is not directing the government to pay a particular amount of money to the victims because the impact upon uh, individuals. So just now when I went to the status of the number of deaths in India, it is uh, almost amounting to 4.09 lakhs. So when so many people have died, the court has not specified a particular amount of money to be paid by the government. Rather, the court stated that whatever the government has, uh, what do I say, an amount that can be identified with reference to the impact of the disaster upon the moreover uh, when we also specify that whether COVID-19 can be considered as a disaster uh, the petitions were very specific on that aspect as well that the government themselves have submitted much before although it's a one-time pandemic it is a disaster COVID-19 is a disaster so you have identified yeah, that part like like, yeah. like you brought up the point because the, the center had actually invoked the disaster management uh, act the, the previous year and, and also it had yes. included covid 19 as a notified disaster so that comes along disaster, with flood yeah. cyclone etc but it, it has to be treated as, as, a, as a disaster as such yeah absolutely so the minimum when we look uh, into this is yeah go on and yeah, so I was, what I was telling you is uh, the minimum requirement or the minimum uh, facilities that the government will have to provide by means of extra assistance uh, on account of loss of life was something that is pretty mandatory. And uh, I don't think that if, if they have come up and stated, okay, the government is not in a position to afford uh, at least a minimum of four lakh rupees per person for the deaths, we could have identified some sense in the uh, statement or argument. If considering the uh, lowering GDP rate or whatever the case be. But the argument made before the court was it is not a mandatory aspect or it is just a recommendatory clause for the government is something that I found to be uh, pretty confusing or um, pretty argumentative per se. Yeah, Minaj, go ahead, please. Yeah, I, I don't think the problem here is the quantum of compensation because I think, uh, like all Adam already stated, that the affordability isn't a problem because. Uh, taking into in, taking India's GDP into consideration, we can afford compensating the the victims with four lakh rupees. But I think in this in this manner, we need to try to look at the loss of livelihoods of many people and how the effect of COVID nineteen affects different people differently. Like if you look at the lower ranks of society, if you look at the uh, the what do you say the unorganized sector, etc., the impact is much more than higher up. And when we look at this, it's difficult to ascertain a quantum of compensation that would be that would uh, sort of benefit each section of society or give that sort of support to each uh, each and every section of society. And also, when we look at improving the health infrastructure, yes, of course, it would help prevent more deaths. But I don't think it's it's a measure that would would uh, sort of even uh, help get these victims back on their two feet. And that's something that I think we need to come to terms with. Yeah, I, I think and also taking into consideration, that, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Also taking into consideration Sorry. that the PM is the ex officio chairman of the National Disaster Management Authority, if I'm not wrong. Where does the aspect of the PM Cares Fund come into this whole uh, come into this whole picture? That's that's pretty interesting to think about where the PM Cares would come to. I, I but I don't know if uh, I don't. Oh, can know you get... No, it's interesting you bring about the. Uh, uh, PM cares into uh, this aspect. Uh, I mean, I don't. Uh, so I don't think uh, um, you know the Disaster Management Act can actually uh, like they can use that to invoke and to transfer any funds from the PM cares. And uh, so I, I think uh, uh, that's I think that's a whole other issue. Then I think there needs to be some deliberation upon that because we're basically unaware of how the PM cares exactly works and how they can actually allocate the funds. Uh, because there's a lot of ambiguity with that, but I think that's a whole separate topic to deal with um, about the quantum of who should get what, right? So this is something even the court pointed out, saying that so it's not that there are no compensation schemes. Karnataka is doing something, Madhya Pradesh is uh, doing something similar. Uh, I think there's one more state which I can't recall, but there are states which are uh, giving compensation to COVID victims. 
um now the problem is that there is no defined structure anywhere so it's not that okay you if you have a income below this uh then you are uh, you are eligible for this uh there is no such scheme it just says compensation for you get 50 lakhs uh, uh, sorry 50000 in if one of your loved ones is there so this is something also that you know the court pointed out saying the reason we're giving you the six week timeline is also for you to create a structure wherein there uh, you create uh, you give compensation for those according to certain guidelines certain criteria so yeah even considering that aspect uh, i would i mean let's also look into the eligibility or who should receive what this like what we have been stating this before uh, so supreme court also made a statement okay it's not uh, uh, what do i say it's not uh, appropriate for the court to designate a particular amount but the court also made about a recommendation that uh, all those individuals all those uh, deceased families should come about with the certificate the death certificate that uh, states that the actual cause of death was out of covid 19 so this might be one of the recommendations that would have been brought forth by the court to prevent exploitation of such fund uh, fund grant or by individuals who are not actually eligible for the same because uh, we have we have been hearing a lot of cases of uh, what do i say for the purpose of burial people change or people try to influence others in order to influence the authorities to change the cause of death for the purpose of uh, religious burials and all those functions so there might there are definitely a lot of uh, a huge scope of exploitation of uh, this particular fund which could be to an extent prevented by uh, whatever recommendation that the supreme court had uh, just stated with respect to death certificates and uh, now the biggest question that we might be uh, having at hand will be definitely a small uh, lacuna that is existent within the act within this section 12 of the act because uh, even if you look into the uh, provision per se the provision that has been uh, divided into uh, three sub three sections subsections per se where uh, one is minimum requirements minimum requirements to provide the relief second one special uh, special provisions to be made for widows and orphans and third one like we said uh, ex gratia ex assistant so the moral obligatory uh, it's actually a moral obligatory uh, compensation to look into the definition of ex gratia but uh, under a statutory uh, cover up of this particular act on loss of life or on assistance of the damage that has happened and lastly such other relief uh, as may be necessary so definitely uh, checking the quantum of compensation will definitely be a task that will be put upon the national authority uh, with the relevance of the act per se because the act is not specific about the value or any sort of uh, such aspect so uh, do you guys think that uh, we should work upon this uh, uh, ambiguity that is prevalent within the act or should there be a precise Uh, what do i say uh, development of a particular provision that states about the quantum of compensation as such uh, you guys like, want to go ahead or should yeah, i yeah oh, uh, see like as we pointed out with regard to what the what the what the court will take uh, under the garb of how to really take into take into consideration for the compensation aspect the government in karnataka has already stated that with regard to dispersing the the covid 19 compensation you basically need to show the covid positive report or the documentation basically it's stating that you had some treatment for any covid and any kind of uh, symptom as such and basically i think they had uh, previously that that there had this particular scheme from out wrong for uh, for those who were below the poverty line and, and that's basically around 1 lakh from out wrong for the uh, those 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 people who have actually lost their breadwinners or or the earning member as such so uh, that's one thing uh, but uh, but does it come like uh, basically with 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 your, with your question does it also come with the proper aspect of auditing as such uh, looking into the aspect of the number of the actual number of deaths and also with regard to the hospital record as such for eligibility for the uh, covid compensation because uh, exact covid covid auditing should be taken care of it with, with regard to this aspect no uh, to uh, with, with respect to the quantum right um if you pointed out rightly that documentation with the death certificate and all there are a lot of issues because see with covid it's not very simple it's not just covid 19 that can kill you because um it it tends to affect people who already have pre existing conditions uh, like diabetes or if you have certain heart ailments it tends to affect them the most right so uh, in many cases what tends to happen is people may may be affected by covid and uh, soon after they may die of a heart attack right so technically on paper the cause of death is a, a cardiac arrest or, or whatever the technical term is for that right but the underlying issue is covid 19 okay. 
so in these situations even though a person may have died because of covid 19 they would be termed as oh he was a heart patient therefore uh, he, uh, he or she passed away so these are some things that need need to be taken into account right whether that uh, whether a certain person was in uh, was affected by covid 19 in in certain span of time so uh, you also need to uh, you also need to i think yeah auditing measures need to be taken into consideration uh, like are, are they supposed to take this work? like for example are you supposed to take this covid report are you supposed to get it attested by another uh, government body or examiner or whatever uh, all these things need to be taken into consideration and also you need to look at uh, who would be eligible for what amount right because you can't keep a blanket okay i'm just going to give 50000 to everyone it doesn't work that way because many people are genuinely are able to afford that uh, who maybe a loss of one breadwinner doesn't really derail their lives completely right in certain situations there is so and you also have to look at who who, uh, who would be eligible in the sense that whether frontline workers are eligible eligible or not because there are already there is already an insurance scheme made for frontline workers so in such situation are they eligible so these are some questions that the government has to answer while giving such uh, you know while formulating these guidelines Yeah, and one more setback. I think the auditing measures might take is the government's trying to cover up the actual true number of COVID deaths that have taken place. And even when we look at hospitals, like you said, they can't really ascertain that COVID is the reason for death because someone might die of a heart attack, etc. So that's one of the reasons I feel that you know even the government's cover up and trying to cover the actual number of COVID deaths would lead to a lot of problems in the auditing process. I mean, as yeah. that's a, I mean, whatever Alden has stated now is something my thought just uh, pondered into right now, because that's a very valid aspect. Because a lot of cases I have, uh, I had this confusion before also, but I could not find an answer for this. So beyond the statutory, what do I say? Confusion we have at hand, we have this aspect as well. I don't know how they're going to address this because a uh, lot most of the cases, especially uh, those who uh, you know, aged people who are affected by COVID nineteen. Uh, suffer a lot just because they have a pre disease i mean a pre condition of a particular disease right. so uh, how are they going to detect whether the actual cause the statement stated by the court was actual cause of that is covid 19 i don't know how do they understand this uh, ground root uh, level or reason behind the particular death of the individual so very valid question again uh, beyond the scope of it or after considering this uh, problem at hand we also have to uh, recognize the quantum uh, uh, value of compensation provided out of the uh, statutory measures as well i mean how how will you recognize the amount of money affected because of the breadwinner of the family is dead or if another individual depending upon their age depending upon every what do i say every compensatory yeah, yeah. Uh, elements of it will have to be checked into condition yeah that's a very valid aspect i i just thought of it so right many- now Yeah, yeah. there are so yeah. many factors that need to be taken into consideration it's not a it's not you just can't it's not a one size fits all thing so uh, I, i it should be t- looked at very carefully because your and the one of the arguments by the side of the petitioner was that as a government right you you have the word socialist in your preamble and you need to provide a, some sort of social security net and uh, some sort of protection to your citizens you need to provide them some sort of confidence that you know tomorrow if something happens the government is going to provide for our welfare it's going to create that sort of system whether that is a uh, they gave the example of frontline workers but that argument falls a little moot because they the government has insurance schemes for uh, frontline workers now the ground reality of whether that's implemented or not is uh, something i have not looked into as of now but uh, but they do have something on paper at least at the moment so yeah uh, important to look at all these things Yeah, like even basically upon the aspect of the the PM care, like like uh, though we might diverge a bit uh, away from from, from the DMA, mm-hmm. like even the PM care is uh, basically states with regard to uh, those children who have lost their uh, their their parents as such. So if, if once they turn eighteen, like they they would be able to get they would be able to get a uh, monthly stipend once they turn eighteen, and also a fund of around ten uh, lakhs in the in the turn around twenty uh, three. and also with regard to the educational loan and and those aspects as well but uh, what i found was very, very peculiar was that if the government is stating that it's not mad, like what what we come back to our in, in initial question of if it is mandatory or not the first question is you had invoked the the, the dma in the first place so obviously the, the the provisions also come along with it so once you invoke the dma you cannot say that uh, 
the, because health is actually a state subject it's not it's not a central government uh, subject as, as such so you invoked in the act in the first place so kind of uh, taking over taking charge of the, of the entire condition at hand though by uh, though not giving it to the states entirely and uh, also with, uh, with with section 12 and section 13 as they are to loans as such so these are particular aspect also have to be, ha- has to be pondered upon by the government before giving uh, such, such such kind of statement as well but yeah uh, over to you alden if you have any for the for the point yeah, to i completely i you. completely agree uh, and this is this is one aspect uh, one aspect which i really liked about this particular judgment was that it took into consideration the various factors uh, that was brought before the court right so it also uh, once uh, one specific paragraph mentions that the state uh, state disaster management authorities and the state governments are key stakeholders in this matter Hmm. so if the government uh, when the government is formulating some sort of uh, scheme of for compensation uh, they need to take into account what these stakeholders have to say right so because the state disaster management authorities are going to be disp- uh, dispensing the funds that are coming to them right and currently the compensation schemes that are being carried out are by the state governments so at a more at at a more localized level where where when you have so many things to look at you need more active involvement from the district and state authorities so if if you, if the government does not take into consideration what they have to say because the state governments are more be, are better equipped to know what kind of conditions are in the state what kind of uh, cases are what is the ground reality because in some states like for example when it came to the oxygen crisis right mm-hmm. maharashtra was better equipped because they knew what was coming in the second wave so they were better equipped with their oxygen supplies as compared to karnataka where here it was absolute it was absolutely disastrous so many people lost lives because no oxygen right so the ground realities are different in every state so if you don't if you don't include these key stakeholders you're falling short so you can create the best compensation policy that you think it is but it will fall short if its implementation is uh, not done appropriately with the right stakeholders that's right yeah um moreover i mean with well versus the fact that the third wave is uh, coming soon i mean just check the news and this found this news and my morning mood is scrapped so we have been behind our uh, laptop screens for a long while now we have been having these discussions all the way through and uh, i do not know what is the next step that we have because most of the na- i mean many of the nations are coming getting recovered they don't have to wear their masks anymore they can go in masks anywhere they want they can go watch ma- matches and do whatever they want so i mean i feel i mean we all feel bad because we are still in a very similar state we are not in any better position so the uh, i literally recognize uh, all the directions provided by the supreme court per se in a positive manner but definitely there are a lot of lot of questions still unanswered because one definitely who gets what who gets what is the biggest question out there or the elephant in the room uh, although um, supreme court i mean uh, literally addressed a couple of issues per se with adherence to the statutory provisions at hand but still a big question is yet to be addressed who gets what and uh, even the club uh, with petitions uh, one had stated about the central uh, central authorities uh, functions and state authorities functions just like alden said it's a club petition so uh, considering all these facts uh, what do you guys think we have at hand i mean what is there to be checked forward especially when we are entering to the third phase of this uh, okay not end game sorry okay of this game <laughs> what is what are we what do we have at hand when we enter into the third phase of this uh, particular pandemic do you guys think that with respect to compensation per se do we have anything uh, any step forward uh, what do i say to to get away with this particular situation with respect to compensating the victims uh i have a personal feeling uh, it might be something that is limited to the knowledge i have till date on this particular mechanism that uh, like the petition states the petition also uh, demanded for the working of state authorities to develop a mechanism that could be uh, working upon a on a federal level i mean on a state level uh, provision of compensation so how do you guys think can we move forward with this compensation scheme or mechanism especially when we are entering the third wave of the disaster yes of course a disaster so how do you think we can work upon it do you think that delegating it to the state authorities from the national scheme or a separate uh, schemes to be developed for the state authorities to be mechanized with respect to compensation what do you guys think will be an easy easy call upon the government per se 
I think relying on Alden's point earlier, the states are well equipped and know their you know, the conditions and the intrinsic conditions of the healthcare system in their in their own particular states. So, if the national authority could sort of divert some funds to the state governments, that would be a more practical approach towards this. And also, if we look at another aspect of competition compensation, I mean, uh, maybe like in the UK and the US, there are unemployment compensation schemes as well for people who have lost their jobs and lost their livelihoods due to COVID nineteen. So maybe if the government and the national disaster authority bringing that aspect to it would be beneficial for many families who have not lost their loved ones but have suffered severe financial crisis or have lost their uh, breadwinning capacity so maybe if the if the government can look into that aspect as well it would be beneficial for the public at large absolutely and uh, take of course state uh, you have to work with the state governments in all of these matters because uh, even if you create a Comp national compensation, whatever uh, a scheme for the country, implementation is by local authorities. There is no denying that because you can't just keep sending people from Delhi to go all over the country to carry out one thing, right? So you need the local authorities to work in on this. And uh, like even for example, like I don't want to bring this uh, the farm issues back here, but even when you looked at farm laws, uh, you had uh, like so they abolished the Mandi system. A lot of states it didn't matter because the Mon Mondays you, you, in Telangana or uh, Andhra Pradesh it's barely used. No one, no farmers use the Mandi system. Whereas in Punjab it is used wide, uh, wide scale, right? So that uh, that's why a national scheme didn't really, uh, you know, was the response to the same was not uniform because some states did not really care, whereas the others were quite uh, upset about it. So the same logic applies here as well, right? You, you can't just uh, put, you know, one one size fits all is not something you can afford, especially in something as unprecedented as uh, COVID nineteen. So the healthcare systems are different. The kind, uh, you know, the population, the demographics are very different. So to uh, so you know, state governments have to make they have so the, I think one way to go about it is with the state government, uh, the national government needs to provide a model for compensation, and allocate uh, the funds accordingly based on the population, based on the uh, you know how many like how many people are vaccinated in each state. You need to take these factors into consideration as well, right? Because once a certain amount of people are vaccinated, the chances of uh, spread are lesser, or the chances of uh, death among these uh, these populations statistically are much uh, lesser. So it does make sense if if a state is ninety percent vaccinated, I can't just go throw thousands of crores on them for compensation, which is very less likely to happen. So these things need to be looked at and uh, in how they want to go ahead with uh, with these compensation schemes, how much funds to give, to whom to give. So yeah. Yeah, like uh, basically tying tra on the point, it's uh, streamlining it to to the states and uh, and giving more more powers as such. And I, I think the already since I already mentioned with regard to what the powers and the functions of the national authority under the DMA also basically it approves the national plan and also uh, draws down several guidelines to be followed by the state authorities recommending provisions of funds, especially under section uh, uh, section six, and also with regard to. Pro uh, for the purpose of mitigation of these uh, of these uh, disasters as well. So, with that being at the hindsight, and also uh, under Section 10, uh, uh, two, where it, uh, e where it provides with regard to providing necessary technical assistance to the state governments and state authorities for prevent pre pre preparing the disaster management plan in accordance with the guidelines stated. So, I think these uh, once the guidelines really come up, come across and, and with the time frame given of six weeks, we'll be able to get get a more clearer picture as to how the government will go, go, going to come forward with a more national nationwide scheme as such so uh, with that being said i think uh, we have come to the to, to the end of the uh, podcast session and uh, i would like, like to thank alden once again for coming over and sharing his insight on, on the same so also do uh, check out the imagine order they are coming up with great podcast sessions especially on, on the ones with regard to journalism and, and the bias as well and also the the recent interview uh, as well so uh, do 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 check, uh, check them out and uh, uh, any final words or any kind of conclusion you would like to make with regard to the, the session, uh, all of you. Yeah. Okay, um, I think this is a very interesting uh, judgment considering that, you know, uh, even though we've had uh, like an epidemic before, we've been hit by various uh, uh, viruses like the influenza, smallpox, all of this, and they've, Cause you know considerable change in our society. Something, some interesting thing I read about the influenza pandemic uh, is one of the reasons of uh, 
the drainage system we have here in Bangalore, which is a very interesting thing to think, think about, right? So mm-hmm. uh, this judgment, something like that, uh, along the lines of that, right, is called, uh, creating a change with respect to how we're dealing with viruses going into the future, how we're dealing with pandemics. And with the third wave, a lot of them are saying the third wave is uh, very most likely to hit us uh, soon in, I um, it may not be as uh, severe as the second one. Some say it is going to be even worse. Again, we don't know. That's just something that we'll have to wait and watch. Uh, but irrespective, now there is some sort of idea of uh, how to go about it. Now that everything's opening up, so you're more likely to spread the disease and uh, maybe more deaths to uh, come along. So in that situation, at least now there is some sort of compensation scheme in place for people apart from uh, certain se- uh, sections, maybe like if you're not a, a frontline healthcare worker, but you are doing some essential work, right? Now you have some sort of scheme, you have some sort of social security net uh, in that case. So I think in that way, this judgment is very, very important. Um, but I think only my... Only concern is going to be how are they going to implement this? Mm. Uh, because our courts have a very, not that great of a track record of keep like you know keep, keeping updated as to how they're going to look into this. Uh, there was this a book by Mr. Arun Shari, the former Minister of Communications, where he was talking about the Bandwa Mukti Morcha case, wherein there were um, uh, groundbreaking guidelines given on bonded labor. Um, but the problem was a lot of people don't know is that after the issuance of the guidelines, it took years and years, like close to three or four CGIs for the guidelines to even be implemented because, well, no one implemented the guidelines despite a Supreme Court order coming. So I think that's the only concern that is there, whether these guidelines are going to be brought out and followed up on by the courts. So there's, you know, just hoping for that to happen. So yeah. Exactly. So I'm being pulled back to our economic concepts of Hicks-Calder efficiency and all, where you want to drag them back to the position they were in. I mean, when you're getting back to normal, (laughs) there are a lot of people who are far behind what you call as normal. So to pull them back to what they were in already, we definitely will have to work upon all these uh, uh, economic aspects of it as well. Okay, I'm reminded of my economic classes. Okay, forget it. (laughs) Semester is over. (laughs) I think a very interesting point Alan made was about the regulatory lag or you know legislatory lag that would be involved in this because they might come up with the guidelines but you don't know how long it's going to take to implement it and actually see it work. So if they could speed up that process, it would actually be a very a good scenario for everybody taking into consideration the third wave and its imminent threat. So uh, yeah, I think all we have to do now is wait for the guidelines to come out and maybe then we could deliberate more. Yes. Yeah. Great. Joel. Yeah, and uh, thank you once again, uh, all of you for tuning in to Argumenta Podcast. So you can t- check out our podcast, uh, the, the, the current ep- episode, the full full one on YouTube and also in snippets in, in, on Instagram and other platforms as well. Also, we have the session across on, on all platforms that is Instagram, YouTube, Spotify, Apple uh, Apple, pod, uh, Apple Podcasts and Google Podcasts as well. And also it will be available on our website as well. So do check out our website. It will be mentioned over here. And uh, thank you once again. Thank you, Alan, for coming over to our session. And uh, thank it, you so it, much. It was a great pleasure. So this current episode, the full length, will be available on YouTube. And also you will be able to find the latest updates about the session as well on Instagram and other platforms as well. So do like, share and subscribe to our channel on YouTube. And also follow our Instagram page with regard to regular updates as well.